este curso de pruebas asistidas por computadoras en dinámica no lineal y este, pues este curso es un curso enfocado a, pues a todos ustedes, estudiantes avanzados, eh, de posgrado, postdocs y también a, a profesores, investigadores interesados en el tema y tenemos la fortuna de tener a dos eh, muy importantes investigadores y también muy buenos amigos aquí del, del departamento que son eh, Jason Mireles James y Jean-Philippe Desart primero eh, nos va a dar una, una, eh, en la primera parte del curso le va a dar eh, Jason Mireles James entonces eh, déjenme hablar un poco de, de Jason pues a Jason yo lo conozco desde hace mucho porque eh, él hizo su doctorado en la Universidad de Texas en Austin y fue eh, alumno de Rafael de la Llave, que fue también mi asesor y este, desde entonces estaba trabajando ya en eh, métodos de pruebas asistidas por computadoras eh, sistemas dinámicos y hizo bastante trabajo cuando éramos estudiantes de doctorado, de hecho Jay también ganó algunos premios por sus este, calidades didácticas entonces para mí es un eh, buen expositor y después Jay fue a hacer un postdoctorado en la Universidad de Rutgers. Estuvo trabajando con varias personas, entre ellos Anselm Schaikov, que también es un experto en estos métodos. Y ahora es profesor de la eh, Florida Atlantic University en eh, Boca Ratón, Florida. Entonces, eh, eh, por favor, eh, si tienen preguntas, pregúntenle a Jay, pregúntenle en inglés. Si nos sienten seguros con el inglés, pregunten en español y entonces yo puedo traducir o cualquiera de nosotros puede traducir. Pero por favor no se queden con, eh, no se queden con dudas. Eh, Jay está en toda la disposición de este, responder las, las preguntas que tengan. ¿no? Entonces, eh, ok, Jay, thanks a lot for, for being here and then uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me say first, on behalf of myself and Jean-Philippe, what a great honor it is to be here today. Uh, I want to thank Renato and Carlos for the invitation and for organizing the workshop and having us here these days. Uh, but I especially want to thank, and from the bottom of my heart, to thank all of you for coming to listen to what we have to say today. This is really exciting for us. Yeah? Um, the title of the workshop involves nonlinear dynamics, right? And of course, we'll have a lot to say about nonlinear dynamics in the next few days. But to begin, I want to be a little more specific, a little more focused. I think on some level what this course is really about, it's about solving nonlinear equations. It's about solving nonlinear equations with the help of the digital computer and ultimately in a mathematically rigorous way that leads to new theorems. Again, with the help of the computer and a lot of mathematics. Okay, so uh, I want to start off at the beginning, yeah? And uh, hopefully, you know, this will go at a, at, a, at a very easy pace at first. So here's a setup. The setup we'll use all the rest of the week. We're interested in uh, continuous, or better yet, uh, smooth maps between Banach spaces. So let's think about a map F between Banach spaces X and Y. And um, we want to solve, since we're in a Banach space, it makes sense to talk about a zero. So we want to solve equations like f of x equals zero, okay? Um, now you might think of x, it could be uh, an equilibrium or a periodic solution of some ordinary or partial or delay differential equation. Could be a covering map or a chart map for some invariant manifold. It could be the solution of some initial value problem, some boundary value problem, okay? That depends uh, on what you're doing, right? But in all of those situations, um, there exist already extremely powerful numerical methods for finding approximate solutions to nonlinear problems, okay, even nonlinear problems in, in infinite dimensions. So the question that we like to think about is this. Suppose you have such a nonlinear problem and you also have in hand a good, maybe a good enough, whatever that means, approximate solution of f of x equals zero. So you know some element of your Banach space x, we'll call it x bar, so that f of x bar is not so big, okay? Can you conclude 
given that information, that there's a true solution, a true zero of f of x, maybe nearby x bar. Okay, and of course the answer is sometimes yes, but it's going to depend on the spaces x and y, the map f, and even on your approximate solution, x bar. Okay? Um, proving that the answer is sometimes yes, of course you have to make precise what you mean by good enough and nearby, right? So that'll be a big part of the fun as this discussion goes on. Okay, here's a little terminology. So you'd like to have some theorem or theorems which help you answer this main question. Okay, and we'll call such a theorem an a posteriori theorem or an a posteriori existence theorem. Because first, you compute some approximate solution of your problem, then by analyzing your problem and that approximate solution, you try to conclude that there's a true solution, that there exists a solution nearby. Okay, um, let's start thinking in one dimension, okay? So in one dimension, uh, imagine you have a uh, function, f of x, and you'd like to prove that it, you'd like to find a zero of f of x, right? So uh, excellent method for doing that is Newton's method, uh, which we all know. You take some initial guess, right? And you look at f of that initial guess. This won't be zero, but hopefully it's not too large. And now you replace the function f of x with its tangent line. And now instead of solving the nonlinear problem you were given, you solve the linear problem, finding where this tangent line intersects, and then you try again. Right? So this is our old friend. And now you repeat, yeah? And hopefully if your initial guess was good, this converges to your true zero. Right? Okay, so... Um, Here's a typical kind of theorem that you, in a numerical analysis course, that you would prove. This is what I would call an a priori theorem for Newton's method, okay? This theorem says, imagine that f is c2, and suppose that it actually has a zero, okay? And suppose that the derivative of f at that zero is non-zero. So the theorem says that there exists a neighborhood, uh, of your true solution so that if you pick a point A in the neighborhood and start your Newton iteration with that point A, that the iteration converges and it actually converges rapidly, right, quadratically fast. Okay? So this is a, a classical kind of theorem about Newton's method uh, that's telling you what kind of problems Newton method is good for. Newton's method is great if you have two derivatives, right? If you had only one derivative or zero derivatives, this theorem is saying maybe you don't try Newton's method, right? Um, but this theorem isn't telling you what happens if you've numerically done some work, right? How close are you to the solution or is there a solution at all? That's what you'd like with an a posteriori theorem. So, um, is it possible to get an a posteriori result for Newton? And I want to... Uh, give you kind of a geometric argument, at least in 1D, that I think says why you should be able to do this. Okay, so imagine instead of the earlier picture where you saw the curve and you knew you had a zero, imagine all you know is you have this single point f of x zero. Okay? And you know, so you, you can think of uh, this as a point on a curve. Okay, so you're constrained to lie on this curve, but you can't see the curve. All you can see is the value of f at x0. But maybe you can compute the derivative at x0, all right? Which you could think about as the velocity of this point, right? So now if you think about the x-axis as a, like a brick wall, and you think of this as a particle moving toward the brick wall with some non-zero velocity, okay? The question is, is the particle going to hit the brick wall or not, right? You know that the answer depends on how fast can the particle accelerate, right? So, if you had some local bounds on second derivatives, and if the second derivative is not too big, then this particle can't bend away from its tangent line fast enough to avoid hitting the ball. There will be a zero, right? Okay, so this is the kind of argument you'd like to make rigorous to have a, an a posteriori theorem. Okay, in one dimension you could do it basically just like I've said here, but if you want to generalize this to higher dimensions, 
uh, it's nice to talk about a little more uh, machinery. So in fact, we'll need a little more machinery. So to generalize this to higher dimensions, to infinite dimensions, we'll use the contraction mapping theorem. So let me just remind you, the contraction mapping theorem says that if you have a map on a metric space or from a metric space to itself, okay, uh, so first is the definition. We'll say that this map is a strict contraction if the distance between any two points is always less than, well, that should be less than or equal to kappa times the distance between the points where kappa is strictly less than one. Okay, so this is what it means to say that a map is a contraction. Okay, and Bonnock's fixed point theorem says that if X is a complete metric space, and if F is a contraction on F, then it has a unique fixed point, right? Okay. So we're gonna be focusing on Bonnock spaces. So if you have a closed subset of a Bonnock space, uh, that subset inherits a metric, basically just from the norm on the Bonnock space. So a closed subset of a Bonnock space is a complete metric space. And those are the kinds of complete metric spaces we'll be interested in. If you rewrite the contraction condition in a Bonnock space, it looks like this, right? The metric is given uh, in terms of the norm. And now we'd like uh, some machinery for measuring contraction rates, right? And the derivative is uh, the right or is a great tool for that. So remember that if you have these Bonnock spaces, X and Y, you have a map between them. The map is fresh differentiable at some point X. If there's a bounded linear operator from X to Y, so that we have this limit, basically saying that A is the best linear approximation of F at X, right? So this is the infinite dimensional version of uh, notion of a derivative. So it's a theorem that if such an operator exists, that it's unique. So we can say, we can call A the derivative of F at X zero. Okay. Now we're really interested in uh, moving around the space. So you can think of the derivative as a map that associates with a point in your space, a bounded linear operator. And if that correspondence is continuous, then you say the map is C1. Right? Okay, you can study higher derivatives by just thinking of DF now as a map from X into bounded linear operators from X to Y. Okay, okay. so here's, in our uh, talks this week, here's how we'll measure contraction rates. Okay, so you can prove a uh, generalization of the mean value theorem. This says that, okay, so here this B is a ball, but when I have B, X, Y, these two, this is the norm on bounded linear operators. So this says if on some ball uh, I have a uniform bound on my derivative, okay, then my map F is Lipschitz on that ball with that bound on the derivative. Okay, so this is a nice way for measuring these contraction rates that you want for the contraction mapping theorem. Okay. Um, so just summing all that up, you know, this says that if you can bound uh, the derivative on your map less than one, then your map is a contraction, right? Um, okay. So, now what I want to do is state and prove a theorem that we're going to use for a posteriori analysis of nonlinear equations between Bonnock spaces. Okay, so this is our setup again. We have uh, uh, F between X and Y, C1. Okay, we have a point in our Bonnock space where the norm of F of X is not too big. That's what you call an approximate solution, approximate zero. Uh, we don't expect that F is a contraction, right? But, so we can look at the Newton method on Bonnock spaces, and it would be this, right? So your 
Your next approximate solution is your current approximate solution plus a perturbation, and you obtain that perturbation by solving this linear equation. Right? Okay, so that suggests that maybe what you can do is study this Newton-like operator in a neighborhood of your approximate solution. Even though F might not be a contraction, you can hope that the Newton-like operator is a contraction uh, near X bar. Uh, okay. So the problem with this is that it's much too hard for me to do, usually. So DF as a function of X varies in probably a very nonlinear way. The inverse of that is even worse. Um, so we cheat. We'll replace df inverse at an arbitrary point with just df inverse at the approximate solution. So that gives this Newton-like operator this new t, okay, where this is now a constant uh, linear operator, not depending on x. Right? Yes, sir. Depends on the shape of the facing of attraction. So we're going to have to find that. We're because if you have a ball, all the points in the ball are going to mm -hmm. attract. But if the basin have a very strange shape, then you try to find a ball in that shape, and that yeah. And the, this is the main problem. Sure. So this is going to be local. Right? We're trying to do, we have the numerical approximation. We're trying to prove that there's a true solution nearby, so that's local. Uh, you'll see that we will get some more control than that, but not as much as you're asking for. Okay? Okay, so this gives a Newton like operator, but again, this is too hard, usually. So, uh, you know, for Bonnach spaces, this may be an infinite dimensional linear operator, which could still be very hard to invert. So we might cheat again, okay? And we just replace, uh, first, we'll replace our derivative, this constant linear operator, with just any linear operator we want, okay? As long as it's a bounded linear operator from x to y. And once we've done that, we'll replace the inverse of df with any operator we want, that goes from y back to x. The first important thing, okay, this lets us define a Newton-like operator, which we're now free to study, may or may not uh, work out well, but we can certainly do this. And if a is one to one, then fixed points of t correspond to zeros of f, okay? Now, in fact, what you would like is that this a dagger somehow approximates your derivative, at least at the numerical solution or the approximate solution. And that A inverse at least approximates the approximate derivative. Okay, so now I have a lot of choices. I'm giving myself just a little bit of room to, to play with. Okay? Okay, so given these, these are my chess pieces. Okay, the pieces are now on the board. Given those pieces, here's the theorem that we'll use, okay? Uh, this is essentially a Newton-Kantorovich theorem, but, well, yeah, it's a Newton-Kantorovich theorem that we're sort of tweaking to make it fit well with computer-assisted proof, right? We're setting up the hypotheses so that the objects in this theorem are things we can actually study with the computer, okay? So... We have all the pieces I've just been talking about, the uh, C1 map F, the approximate solution X bar, the linear operator A dagger, and the linear operator A, which should be one to one, okay? Now what I would like is three positive numbers and one positive function, okay? So this is really scalar data, and this data should satisfy the following, okay? I want this number y0 to be some bound on my defect, but my defect preconditioned by a, okay? And this is nice because f goes from x to y, but a takes me back to x. So f times a is a map from x to itself. So there's some hope of using the contraction mapping theorem. Okay, this is basically measuring your defect, or this is what some people call a posteriori error. Now, 
I'd like Z0 to measure how good a job A does at inverting A dagger. So I multiply uh, A dagger by A. I subtract from the identity. I take the norm in X. Okay, this is some number that says that A is either a very good approximate inverse or it isn't. Right? Now I have a Z1. This is the number that measures how well does A dagger approximate DF, at least at my approximate solution X bar. And again, this is preconditioned by A. Okay? All of this is just data that happens, you know, these are fixed objects, the approximate solution, and then some fixed linear operators that I was allowed to choose. Now I have some local condition. I need like a Lipschitz bound on the first derivative. Okay? So this function Z2, we want it to have the property that when I measure the difference between X bar and an arbitrary X on this ball. Now, R is a variable here, right? So I'm allowed to vary the ball on which I'm making this measurement. You know, I need a bound on that measurement for all the balls of radius R. Okay. So is that where you use the properties of the second derivative? One way to get your hands on this is with the second derivative. Yes. Is, uh, but, you know, somehow you need some Lipschitz bound, at least on the first derivative. Okay. Okay, so given all this data, we define the function PR. Okay, it's just ZR times R squared, minus 1, minus Z0, minus Z1 times R, plus Y0. The theorem is that if we can find a positive R so that this function P of R is negative, then there's a unique X tilde in the ball, actually the open ball, BR, so that F of X tilde is zero. Okay, so these give us sufficient conditions for concluding that we have a zero of F. Okay. Okay, a few remarks. In every example that we'll do this week, it can be arranged that this Z2 is polynomial, which makes P polynomial. Okay, so this is, for this reason, uh, this is called the method of radii polynomials. And it reduces an infinite dimensional zero finding problem to a one dimensional zero finding problem, zeros of, of P, right? Okay. Uh, in applications, what we look for is actually a whole interval of R's so that P of R is negative. So we'll have a, a smallest R you know, where we know that ball contains a unique solution, but we have a whole family of neighborhoods where this happens. So that gives us some isolation, some lower bound on this trapping region that you're talking about. Although certainly if the trapping region is, you know, this can only give us the biggest ball about the approximate solution, right, at best. Now you can see since uh, P0 is Y0, and since P goes to infinity as R goes to infinity, R minus certainly can't be zero, and R plus can't be infinity. This will be some interval away from zero and less than infinity. Right. Okay, so this R minus, the left end of I, gives you the sharpest, or it gives you sharp bounds uh, on your error. This is a very small ball about your approximate solution where you know you have a true solution. And the R plus gives you isolation bound. This is another ball where you know you have uniqueness. Okay, so there are no other solutions in this ball of size R star. Uh, and this can be helpful, not to have just one neighborhood where you have existence and uniqueness, but to have a very sharp neighborhood and also some isolation. One question. It is possible that when we have a map from the finite space, that the the inverse of the derivative cannot be unique that we have. Uh, uh, the, I, the inverse, if it exists, is unique, right? But um, if the operator is uh, a bounded operator. For bounded linear operators, we'll have a unique inverse. Maybe we have no inverse, but if there's an inverse, there's just one, right? 
Okay, thanks. All right, I'd like to go through the proof of this theorem, okay? Because this is uh, going to be the workhorse for our uh, entire workshop. And, um, well, the proof is, is not so hard, okay? Could you recall, please, the sentence of the theorem? Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so we've defined this function, right? So now assume I have an R where it's negative. Okay, we're fixing an R so the P of R is less than zero. All right, now I can define an operator T on the closed ball of radius R about my approximate solution X bar as this Newton-like operator, X minus A F of X, okay, for everybody in this ball. Okay, and the way the proof is going to go is to try to show that T, to try to use the Bonnach fixed point theorem. So I want to show that T maps BR uh, into itself. In fact, it's going to map into the interior. Then we'll want to show that T is a contraction on this closed ball. If we can do that, then since uh, the closed ball is a complete metric space, uh, if we have that this is a contraction, we'll have a unique fixed point of T, okay, and then since A is one to one, a unique fixed point of T gives us a unique zero of F, okay? So that's the strategy. So the first thing to see is that T is as regular as F is. And the, you know, the formula for the derivative of T is just the identity minus A DF, okay? So that's gonna work for everybody in the ball. So then we can try to bound the norm of the derivative of t, okay? That's, of course, the norm. We just plug in this formula here and try to estimate. We'll use the triangle inequality twice. So I'll add and subtract a times a dagger, and then add and subtract a times df at x bar. Okay? So I have, I started with the identity, then minus a times a dagger, plus a times a dagger, uh, minus a dfx bar plus a dfx bar, then minus the a times df that I'm stuck with from the definition of the operator, and then the triangle inequality. But then these are exactly the quantities, you know, I, I set myself up to have bounds on these. This is uh, z0, z1, and z2, right? Z2 times r. Okay, so now since PR is negative, right, let's look at what that means. Well, I'm going to take this R times minus 1. I'll have a minus R. I'll move it to the other side. These other negative guys are positive. So I have an expression like this. Okay, let's divide by R. Now everything in sight is positive. So if this quantity plus Y over R is less than 1, then individually they're less than one, okay? But this quantity over here, this is our bound for the derivative. Okay, so this is precisely telling us that the derivative uh, is less than or equal to this lip, you know, this is our uh, contraction constant and it's strictly less than one, okay? Now that it doesn't really help us yet until we know that the thing maps the ball into itself. The rest of the theorem is going to use uh, this estimate on the derivative, you know, every chance we get. So I'd like to show that T maps the ball into itself. So I pick a point in the ball, I look at T of that point, and then I measure how far away I am from X bar. Okay? So that's, I need to bound this quantity. I'll add and subtract T of X bar. This is just a times f of x bar, okay? And then for this, we'll use the mean value inequality, okay? So again, the, our hypotheses give us a bound on this quantity, and this is what we just bounded. 
in the previous slide. So we have this, right? But x minus x bar is less than r. You distribute the r. You're looking at this polynomial. And the argument from the previous slide says, well, if pr is less than 0, then this thing is less than r. Okay? And actually, if you think about taking a, an x right on the boundary, you know, this is a closed ball. This is saying something on the boundary actually goes inside. So that the t is taking a closed ball, in, at least into its interior. Okay? But certainly, we're taking the closed ball into itself. Okay, so now we have a uh, mapping defined, you know, from a complete metric space into itself. And, you know, you basically, if you pick X and Y's and B, you look at uh, their difference. Mean value inequality again says that we're done, right? So this is a strict contraction on a complete metric space. Okay, and as I said, uh, the fixed point, the unique fixed point, is actually not on the boundary, which is just worth noting, okay? Okay, so once you have a fixed point, since A is 1 to 1, we actually have a unique 0 of F. So this is this, is this theorem, okay? And uh, this will be the workhorse of this workshop. We'll solve a number of, I think, uh, interesting applied problems using this setup, okay? Now, uh, Renato asked about second derivatives. So, um, I was kind of asking for a lot. I was asking for this map to be defined on all of the Bonnock space X. Maybe it's only defined on an open space, open uh, subset. If that's true, you can sort of localize this theorem. Okay, so especially if F is C2, you can uh, look for a uniform bound of your second derivative on some large ball, radius R star, that you get to pick. All right? If you can bound the second derivative on such a ball, then in any smaller ball, you have a um, bound like this. Okay. Okay, so in that case, your z2 is just a constant function, but a constant function only defined for r bigger than zero and less than r star. And so then your p is only defined. Uh, but in this case, your p is quadratic which is, of course, your favorite polynomials, right? <laughs> okay. And now the proof goes through just like before. Okay. So to use a theorem like this, to do a computer-assisted proof, let me just recap, because I feel like I'm going kind of fast, and it's a lot of stuff. But so we need to do some computations, right? We want an approximate solution. It was in, again, in our talks, we'll be using computers to get this approximate solution. We need an approximation of the derivative. Again, we can use, well, both computers and pen and paper to get this. Then we need to approximately invert this A dagger. And in infinite dimensions, so I'm going to do some finite dimensional examples now. Uh, but when Jean Philippe talks about infinite dimensional uh, examples, you know, you'll use your understanding of the asymptotics of the derivative actually to define this A and A dagger. There'll be more about that later. But the other thing you need that I haven't really said anything about at all, well, it's implied, okay, but you need the ability to check some bounds like this. You know, um, that the norm of something is less than something else, right? You're going to want to do this on the computer. And so this is where the uh, interval arithmetic comes in, okay? So uh, I'm not going to say too much about interval arithmetic. Uh, there are a lot of experts on interval arithmetic here, so, um, yeah. On the other hand, if you've never seen interval arithmetic before, I just want to say enough about it to make it seem kind of plausible, okay? So interval arithmetic is uh, software that lets you manage hardware round-off errors, right? So the, the digital computer doesn't really add numbers, right? it does something almost like addition, almost like subtraction, almost like multiplication, right? Even, you know, numbers like uh, a third, this has no floating point representation exactly on the computer. You can't even put this number in the computer, right? 
But what you could do is you could take one and divide it by three and round down, and one and divide by three and round up, and now you would have an enclosure of one third in terms of floating point numbers. So this is a theorem, computer assisted proof, right? That one third is between this number and this number, right? So this is the kind of thing you could hope to do with the computer. Um, so that's just, you know, representing a number. If you start to add them, it's even worse, of course. But again, here's a computer assisted theorem that one half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth is between these two floating point numbers, okay? Um, maybe as a mathematician, this seems like an, ele in an inelegant way to think about numbers, but the great thing about floating point arithmetic is it's blindingly fast. Okay, so, you know, modern computers are fantastically good at doing this, right? So we would like to use that ability, that speed of the computer, and this is what we're willing to give up to use that floating point arithmetic, okay? So here's a theorem you could get. One half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth is less than or equal to this number, right? And that's the kind of thing I need in my theorem. My theorem, I need some complicated expression is less than or equal to some number, right? This is the kind of thing you could hope to get out of interval, out of a computer using interval arithmetic, okay? Okay, another thing, uh, that good interval arithmetic packages can do is they can bound the ranges of the usual functions. So for example, I could ask a good interval arithmetic package, what is cosine of the interval minus 0.1 to 0.1? And I would get an answer like this back, right? So I can't compute cosine of an interval, but I can enclose cosine of an interval or something like this, right? one over the square root of some number minus some interval. And you can see here, actually, it's not so good, this enclosure. Okay, so you have to be careful with this stuff. It's not a uh, magic solution to all our problems. Uh, sometimes this can really be a disaster, right? But these are the kind of things you can do, and they're at least correct. Uh, so the package, we use mostly uh, IntLab with MATLAB to do interval arithmetic, but there are also C++ packages. There are Julia libraries. Julia libraries, I think, written by maybe some of the people in this room, or, uh, yeah? Okay. So, people here are experts on this, right? Okay. So, let me do an example of a computer-assisted proof, something very simple, using our, the setup I just described. Okay, let's prove, this is like the uh, first problem in any book on numerical analysis, right? We've all lectured about this problem. Cosine, a uh, fixed point of cosine x, uh, that's solve cosine x equals x, right? Okay, so if I use Newton's method um, to try to find a zero of cosine x minus x, uh, and I start maybe at zero, I pick that just out of, thin air, maybe you like some other number better, but I picked zero. Five steps, I get this as my approximate solution to that fixed point problem. If I take cosine of this number minus this number, my computer says the answer is zero, which is of course a lie, but uh, <laughs> that's what the computer says. So I'm close though, I'm so close I've tricked the computer, right? So we'll use this radii polynomial setup for cosine x minus x. So first of all, the derivative in this case is pretty easy to compute. Second derivative, pretty easy to compute, okay? Okay, I'm gonna let a dagger, so a linear operator on the line, it's just a number, right? So let a dagger be this number. How do I get this number? I just did a floating point evaluation of the sine function at my approximate solution. So no interval arithmetic, okay? This is just represented as floating point. Now my A will be this number. So the inverse of a linear operator on the line is the reciprocal. So I just compute one over A. Again, no interval arithmetic, just in floating point numbers. 
This number isn't one over that number, but it's pretty close, right? Computers do that pretty, pretty okay. Okay, so there's X bar, A dagger, A. I'm going to pick somewhat arbitrarily uh, an R star is 0 0.1. I'm going to localize my problem on this number plus or minus 0 0.1. And then I'm going to bound the second derivative on that interval just using interval arithmetic. So I just plug that interval into cosine, take the absolute value, a good interval arithmetic package comes back to me. with this bound on my second derivative, okay? So this is my data for that theorem, right? Okay, now I can compute. Now things have to start happening with interval arithmetic. I need to enclose, I take x bar to be an interval of width zero, I compute f of that, I multiply that by a, treating everything as intervals, as intervals and take the absolute value. I get this answer for my bound on my defect, that's the y0 bound, okay? The a times a dagger minus one, uh, similar, right? I'm multiplying two numbers together, taking them away from one, I get something in quite a small interval containing zero. Same df, a bar minus df. Uh, here, you know, you're taking a interval computation of the derivative, and then you take away from that your approximate derivative. Yeah, I mean, all of those are good, but the m is not great. The m is not great, and you'll see worse than this, but it's a quadratic yeah. term. So m is appearing with something, an r squared, where r might be 10 to the negative 16. 10 to the negative 16 squared is quite small, and then this is not so bad, right? Yeah. Okay, so, and then here's our Z2 bound. I define this function uh, to be just, say, the right end of this interval, but only for R's less than 0.1, okay? Because this estimate only makes sense on that interval uh, near X bar, okay? Okay, now it's just the quadratic formula, right? To find the zeros of this and... Uh, Yeah, we get pretty good results, right? So if R is any number in this interval from 1.327 times 10 to the minus 16 all the way to 0.1, then this polynomial is negative, okay? So you can conclude that there's a unique fixed point x star, and x star is in here, plus or minus this, you know, very small number. But it's also unique in a much larger neighborhood, right? x bar plus or minus 0 0.1, okay? Where am I on time? What time is it? 4.7. Great. Great. <laughs> yes. Can you use higher to make sense? Yes. Uh, for, I mean, you go to multiple precision, you can make this number close to whatever your machine epsilon is for the precision that you're working with. So in principle, you could make this as small as you wish, but multiple precision is way slower than hardware arithmetic. Um, but yeah, you can improve this, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, this problem is not going to be... Uh, this problem is not so <laughs> stiff, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Let, let, let's do it again, I want, because I know that there are people in the audience who are really interested in interval arithmetic and uh, have, have worked on these things before. I want to compare this approach to another approach, since I seem to have plenty of time, okay? So the thing that I remember from teaching numerical analysis is that this is actually a contraction near that fixed point. So everything I just did was, uh, I may, mean, maybe I used uh, a club to, you know, open an orange or something, right? Um, what if we try to do this with the contraction mapping theorem? So, um, here's a shot at that. I'm gonna pick an R. Let's, I'm gonna, and I'll, you'll see in a minute why I pick this R. But I'm just gonna pick 1.6 times machine epsilon. Okay, machine epsilon is uh, two to the minus 52, which is about 2.2 times 10 to the minus 16. 
And I'm going to define a ball about my approximate solution whose radius is that r. Okay? And that looks like this. Now I can use interval arithmetic to check. That should say subset. Okay, it says equals, but it should say subset. When, I say, when I'm saying equals here, what I mean is that if I compute cosine of that interval, uh, my software returns for me this interval, which means I know that if x is in B, cosine of x is, can, is an element of this interval. Okay, but that's the interval I started with. So uh, cosine x is mapping that B into B, okay? Now I can look at the derivative, which is just a derivative of cosine uh, uh, is negative sine, but with the absolute value, it's just a sine. So I can take now sine of this interval. I see that that's contained in an interval which is bounded away from one. Okay, so I now have a map from a complete metric space, namely this set into itself. I have the derivative less than one. So there's a... Uh, unique fixed point in B by the contraction mapping theorem. And this argument was maybe a lot simpler than what I just did. But if I try again with R equals 1.5 times machine epsilon, the proof fails. Okay, uh, my interval arithmetic package can't verify that cosine of that smaller B is, you know, goes into itself. Now, the number that I got with this radii polynomial approach was substantially smaller than 1.6 times machine epsilon. It was actually quite a bit smaller than machine epsilon even. I was at about 1.3 times 10 to the minus 16. Okay, so that's a lot smaller than the 1.5 where this fails. Now again, I know there are experts in the room, so people will say, sure, but you should have done a newton cry check or some kind of interval Newton. Okay, um, so I did. And, of course, the interval Newton works a little better. The proof works for 1.1 times machine epsilon, but fails for machine epsilon. So the radii polynomial still gave me substantially better error bounds. And it should, because, okay, let me not get ahead of myself. So any t sort of interval method, you're checking estimates using interval arithmetic. Machine precision is going to be pretty close to the best you could ever hope to do, right? Um, on the other hand, with the method of radii polynomials, you don't have to guess a neighborhood and then check that the ball maps into itself. You don't have to iterate, do some iterative procedure to find the right neighborhood. You just take your data, right? Your approximate solution, approximate derivative, approximate inverse of the approximate derivative. And given that data, you find every neighborhood where this thing is a contraction. Okay, so it's a little more work, but you get a little more out of it. Okay, so if we're being honest, but the downside is that it's more work. Okay, you have to, you know, check more inequalities. You have to do some estimates of second derivatives and things like this. But if you're doing a problem like some of the things we'll talk about later this week, where you're doing a, you're building a computer-assisted proof on another computer-assisted proof, on another computer-assisted proof, on another computer-assisted proof, every multiple of machine epsilon you lose, you're never going to get back. Okay? So if you can be greedy about them, this can really help sometimes, especially after 10,000 steps. Okay? It starts to really, it can matter. Um, the other thing is, is if you study infinite dimensional versions of newton Crychek. Most of the versions that I know, and I may have missed some, I admit that, but uh, the, the versions that I've seen are formulated in a Hilbert space. Okay, and the, the, we're gonna work in spaces that aren't Hilbert spaces. Just, they'll be just Banach spaces. Okay, so um, if I don't need that Hilbert space structure, that's, that can be an advantage sometimes. Okay. Okay, I think I still have some time, right? What time is it? Great. So let me finish up talking about, you know, a slightly less trivial problem. 
And this is a problem that actually both of us will come back to several times in the next few days. So this is a restricted four-body problem uh, that I actually should thank Jaime for introducing me to some number of years ago at, I believe, uh, a, a tavern in uh, Penn Station, right? <laughs> so the idea is that you have three massive bodies. They're in an equilateral triangle configuration. So you know, you know that's a relative equilibrium of the three-body problem. You change to co-rotating coordinates so that these become singularities of your vector field, and you're interested in the motion of a fourth massless body. And usually people normalize so that the masses add up to one. Okay? Uh, so this is the vector field for this problem where we have all these, uh, excuse me, one over r, you know, r to the two-thirds power, minus two-thirds power kind of nonlinearity. All right. So understanding the dynamics of this is, this is a very interesting question, I think. So the first thing we could talk about or should talk about are equilibrium solutions, right? So an equilibrium solution satisfies these equations, but this simplifies a lot because even I can solve w equals zero and v equals to zero in my head, and that eliminates this and this. So you're really looking for zeros of this map from the plane to itself, okay? Okay, so it's just a function of two variables, uh, two equations and two unknowns. Um, surprisingly, maybe, maybe not surprisingly, but it was interesting to me when I started to, to read about this that uh, it's actually quite hard to understand the equilibrium set for this, this problem, okay? It's not so easy. Okay, what I wanna do, I wanna do a computer-assisted proof just for an equilibrium solution of this four-body problem. Okay, so this is still an easy, finite dimensional problem, but maybe in an application that we care about. So I'll norm my space with this norm because this is a fantastic norm for the computer. Uh, the computer sort of loses nothing when it computes this norm, right? Once you pick this norm, this is the induced matrix norm, and then the induced norm on uh, bilinear forms is this. So, you know, my radii polynomials involved all these norms, norms of matrices, norms of bilinear forms. Okay, and you can just program those norms into your computer using these formulas and then evaluate them with interval arithmetic when needed. Okay? Um, so, numerical work on this uh, by Carlos Samo, Wonderful paper, 1977, says that depending on the value of the masses, this problem has eight or nine or 10 equilibrium solutions, okay? Um, I think Carlos convinced everyone of this, but there was no proof until recently. Whoops, here's a picture. So this is equal masses, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 equilibria. This is for non-equal masses. We've moved away more mass in M1. Two of these equilibria have collapsed and disappeared, and now you're left with the eight, okay? This is sort of typically what the equilibria set looks like. Okay, so Leandro has recently proved, there are about three papers on this, that Carlos was right, which doesn't surprise anybody, but it's nice to have a proof. Right? His proof is computer assisted, and he proved for any values of m1, m2, m3, adding to one, there are always eight, nine, or 10, and that the curve where there are only nine is an analytic curve, okay? This is a very nice result. Uh, but I'll do something much less ambitious with the few remaining minutes of this talk. Just for a particular value of the masses, I'll try to show that there's a saddle focus equilibrium for this problem, and I really want to figure out where it is, okay? Um, why the interest in saddle focus equilibria? Well, if you have a Hamiltonian on R4 like this, and you have a saddle focus equilibrium, it means complex conjugate unstable, complex conjugate stable eigenvalues. If you have a connecting orbit from that equilibrium back to itself, 
which can't be transverse in this sort of full problem, but it can be transverse in the energy section, which is, you know, the, the energy manifold is three-dimensional. Those are two-dimensional manifolds intersecting inside a three-dimensional manifold that can be transverse. If you have such a connecting orbit, then there's a tube of periodic orbits that accumulates to that connecting orbit, okay? And that those periodic orbits are parameterized by energy. And this is called a blue sky catastrophe, okay? So another theorem with the same hypotheses is that if you have this transverse homoclinic, then there's actually a chaotic horseshoe near that homoclinic. Um, this, it's a nice point to stop and think about why you might ever want to do a computer-assisted proof in the first place, okay? So these are fantastic theorems from nonlinear analysis whose hypotheses are quite difficult to verify in particular problems. If you hand me a four-dimensional Hamiltonian system, and even if I know it has a saddle focus equilibrium, it can be very hard for me to prove that there's a transverse connecting orbit. Okay, sometimes it can be done with variational methods, and, but sometimes it's very difficult. But if, with the assistance of a computer, you could prove the existence of a single transverse homoclinic, you now have uncountably many periodic orbits accumulating to that, and you have chaos near that homoclinic. So, for the cost of that computer-assisted proof, you get a great deal of an, uh, additional information. Okay, so this is why I'm interested, uh, it's one reason I'm interested in these kinds of computations, okay? But if you were gonna try to prove something like this, the first thing you would need is to know there was a saddle focus equilibrium, which maybe you could prove by hand, but maybe you can't, okay? So here's a computer assisted theorem, slightly less trivial than the cosine x equals x. So for these masses, the restricted four body problem has a saddle focus equilibrium. In a ball about this point, that ball is of radius three times 10 to the minus 15. Okay, so this is a theorem. How do we prove this? Prove it just like uh, the earlier problem. So here's the proof. So we do a Newton method to get a numerical approximate, a numerical zero, right? Then I compute using floating point arithmetic, no intervals, just, you know, I, I find the formulas for the derivative, I evaluate those formulas. Now I have a matrix of numbers, right? This isn't the derivative, but it's very close to the derivative. Now using the computer, I invert that matrix. This A is of course not the inverse of this matrix, but it's pretty close, right? Okay, um, this is where maybe you could imagine if you were in 10 or 50 or 1,000 dimensions, it's nice to not to have to inter invert interval matrices, right? Um, just doing a approximate inverse of an approximate derivative can, can be nice, okay? And then using interval arithmetic, I can check uh, bounds, well, wait, getting ahead of myself again. I can compute the norm of this matrix smaller than this number, okay? Okay, so now I just uh, use, I evaluate this function with these inputs, now using interval arithmetic and multiplying by this matrix, I get this enclosure, you can see if you take the max norm of that, everything's less than or equal to this, times 10 to the minus 14, right? So I'm gonna pick y0 as this number times 10 to the minus 14. So see, this is how I'm using the interval arithmetic to produce these numbers that I need in this theorem. Okay, so this is now, the, you know, theorem. F of that xy that I picked, times this A that I picked, take the norm, it's less than this Y zero that I also picked. Okay. Now I can multiply those two matrices, but do it now with interval arithmetic, subtract the result from the identity, take the matrix norm, and I get this interval enclosure. I take the norm of that, I get this result. So I'll pick Z zero to be this number. 
Yeah? Same thing for uh, a dagger minus df. Now I evaluate this formula using interval arithmetic and take it from that floating point matrix. Take the norm of that, I can take z1 to be this number. Now, you know, in infinite dimensions, this is going to be more work, and this is what John Philippe will move into in the next talk. I, life is a little easier in finite dimensions, right? But these kinds of things will be, will require more thinking combined with computing like this when we do harder problems. Okay. The last thing is I need this bound on the second derivative, so I'll, I'll take a small ball, I'll do a computer-assisted estimate. Again, you can complain. This is not that good an enclosure, and it's a pretty big number, but it's okay because it's going to get hit by r squared. Right? Okay, so I have this. So I take uh, z2 to be this number, but only um, if r is less than r star. Okay. Well, now again, it's the quadratic uh, formula to check that pr is less than zero on this interval. So from about 3 times 10 to the minus 15, all the way out to 0 0.1. But a lot of this is nonsense, because my second derivative bound only holds on a ball of 10 to the minus 6. So I need to throw the appropriate stuff away. And this is my result. Okay, So in a ball of about 3 times well, 10 to the minus 15, there is a unique solution near my approximate solution. And there are no other zeros in a ball of size 10 to the minus 6. OK. Yeah, so that was the proof. OK, so just a few final comments. Uh, I just did an equilibrium of a four-dimensional problem. Uh, that's an invariant set. But there are much more interesting invariant sets than that. And they require more work. Right? And so we'll, that's what we'll be getting into in the next days. Um, OK, what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, I'll actually move uh, for one lecture kind of away from computer-assisted proof and talk about just computing. I'll talk about computing invariant manifolds and then growing those invariant manifolds, but doing it in a way where I can validate all the computations. Along the way, I'll find a lot of numerical connecting orbits, and I'd like to prove some of those connecting orbits are there. So tomorrow, more computations. Then Friday, I'll come back and validate some of these computations. Okay? But before that, John Philippe, the next lecture today is going to be about some infinite dimensional problems um, that you can solve. Infinite dimensional problems, actually, for PDEs that you can solve using this strategy that I've outlined this afternoon. Okay? So thanks for listening, guys. No. What we will do is we'll try to break the problem into a finite dimensional part, which we treat this way, and an infinite dimensional part, which must be treated more by hand. Asymptotics, right? For the finite dimensional part, we'll invert the finite dimensional part of the inverse numerically, which gives us a good approximate inverse. For the infinite dimensional part, we have to do something with as asymptotics to get a good approximate inverse in infinite dimensions. Okay. This will be the idea. Yeah. I should wait maybe for tomorrow, but what's the difference about these uh, techniques? 
um, in comparison to her bank, uh, Bert and Kim Kyo-Singa does. So what I'm trying is, what I'm trying to say is, is you're going to compute with some manifolds, like yes. the table of instead, which is basically doing some continuation techniques. Right? Um, no, I'll do formal power series. I see. Yes. So that's. The so, I think even the non-rigorous numerics that I'll do will be somewhat novel. I hope. Bueno, si no hay más preguntas, propongo que tomemos un descanso de 15 minutos. Aquí hay café, hay galletas, a lo mejor alguien quiere ir a un café o algo así. Y en 15 minutos seguimos con él la parte de la actividad de sal. Este, también hay personas que van a colocarse en la lista, si quieren constancia sobre todo.